Hi, and welcome to the Noise Pack. In this episode, we're going to try another repair. This is a Thorlabs dual channel optical power and energy meter. And it showed up on my eBay randomly for less than 40 bucks, and I just couldn't resist it. Even though it's a somewhat esoteric instrument, it's used quite often in free space optics and laser design when you just want to measure optical power. It does have several interfaces which makes it particularly useful. First, it has the basic analog inputs, photo detector 1, photo detector 2, which then internally go through a trans impedance amplifier. So if you tell it the responsivity of your photo detector, then you can make precise optical measurements. In the back of the unit, there are some DB9 connectors to connect to a so-called smart sensor. It allows you to have the calibration coefficients, serial numbers, and all the settings automatically stored inside the sensor. And those are the Thor Labs C series sensors. So I don't have any of that at the moment, but when this showed up, the display just showed completely white on the eBay listing. Basically, it was sold as defective. When you see a completely white screen, the first thing you think is that, well, the firmware is probably not booting up, so nothing's showing up on the display. But if I turn it on here, look what happens. I'm sure you can kind of tell that it's just super faint. Now, to my eyes, when I look at the display, I cannot see that faint trace of the material being shown. I see a completely blank screen, which is probably what happened to the people who were trying to sort this. So now that you see the faint stuff there, and you can actually see that it does react to the buttons and the menus do change when I press these things. So it is running, now it's probably just a contrast issue. Let's change the angle of the camera and look at the screen. So looking at these sharp angles, you can actually navigate the menus and find all the internal settings. There is a setting for display brightness, but there's no setting for contrast. So this is not a case of someone having accidentally adjusted the contrast to one extreme. Something else is going on beyond that. I couldn't fix it through the internal firmware. And looking at the back of the unit, we do see some more useful features. For example, it does have channel 1 and channel 2 direct analog outputs, so you can use them with a different digitizer, essentially using this instrument as an optoelectrical converter. Here's the sensor inputs with those with the built-in firmware I was talking about. There's a miscellaneous output also with a good dynamic range and a trigger input. So you can actually do triggered measurement and check it out. There's even a USB port and there is a software that you can just simply download. So a pretty capable instrument for doing these kind of measurements. Let's see if you can fix it. And here's a look inside the unit. It's very nice and clean. And we can see a cage over here where all of these sensitive electronics, the high amplification, the current input to voltage output is handled. And these two cables are actually the photo detector inputs from the front. And they're being jumped over and inserted right there next to where the rear sensor inputs are. And that makes sense because if you run these over the PCB, it will be the end of those signals that will pick up so much noise from all the digital activity. Basically, there's a division here inside. Everything on this side is a high sensitive, high gain analog. Everything on this side is the power supply as well as the digital. There's a Xilinx FPGA over there which seems to control the LCD through this ribbon cable. There's some power supply stuff over here, toroidal transformer, here's the AC line filter coming in, wheel the voltage selection and then there is a capacitor in here when then a power switch. So there's a strip at the very top here where the AC line is coming in. Everything is nicely divided. Again, Tor Labs knows how to make these kind of up to electrical conversion devices for sure. USB over here, you can see it jumps all the way over here to the front as well. So there must be some additional things that handle the USB communication. Interesting thing to note is that I don't think there is any DC-DC converters on this. There are multiple full bridge rectifiers over here from the input then being converted with voltage regulator. So everything should be pretty quiet, which is also not surprising. I do want to remove the cage to take a look at this. Now the problem of the contrast has nothing to do with any of the analog stuff. But I did notice something interesting. You probably also noticed when we turn it on, initially the screen is a little bit brighter and then we hear a couple of beep and it then dims down. So the power supply seems to be being dragged down, which is not a good thing. Things shouldn't change like that. So we should do a little bit of digging, seeing why that could be. And with the top of the cage removed, we do see the interesting analog circuitry underneath. And if you look carefully, there is an axis of symmetry in there because we are processing two analog channels simultaneously. And this is a very large dynamic range of current that needs to be converted to voltage. As a result, there are analog switches and a whole bunch of relays in order to do different range switching. And of course, op amps and many other things. A lot of potentiometers too for calibration. None of them are labeled, but I'm not going to touch any of those, of course. The other thing to note, is that there is an LT1010, one over here and one over here. These are unity gain high current output drivers and they are the ones that are driving 
those analog outputs that you can use other digitizers for. You can see that they're also symmetric because there is a pair of each of those. And if you follow that, eventually you get somewhere on the outside and there's some DACs in there, and there's a pair of 250 kilo sample per second, 16-bit successive acropsation ADCs. One over here, this tiny component, and one over here, this tiny component. And these are not going to be very large, of course, because these are serial interfaces. They are going to have fairly low sampling speed, 250K, but they're pretty good ADCs nonetheless, and that's all you need. And then the output of those are processed by the CPLD and then whatever processors on the other side. So the architecture is pretty straightforward. It's just a lot of nice analog circuit design. Now, there aren't a ton of labels on this, but there's a few places, like, for example, plus and minus 15 volts. We can certainly measure those. There's 5 volts and so on. So we should start from that, because that dimming of the power supply was concerning. So let's go ahead and measure these voltage regulators. Let's try the plus 15 volt one. What do we get here? We have plus 7. Well, that's not 15 at all. And then minus 15. What do we have over there? Ooh, minus 8.2. So they're both completely off from where they should be. Now, what are the chances that we have two bad voltage regulators? I would say pretty small. We also look at the heat sink on these two. The heat sink on the plus 15 is much larger than the minus 15. And that makes sense because in a lot of situations, you have much more current from the positive power supply than the negative one. So the current dry isn't even the same. So the fact that both of them are bad probably points to the fact that the issue is before the voltage regulators. In fact, if I can squeeze the probe in there, I can measure the input to the minus 15. Look at that. See, the input to the regulator is minus 9. So, of course, if the input is minus 9, there's no way for the output that can be 15 in a normal re linear regulator. So we have to look more carefully. The problem is further down the line. And I have a couple of ideas. And well, check this out. This thing is set to 230 volts, and that explains pretty much everything we see. Because of this, we are using the wrong transformer ratio. So the input voltage after the full bridge rectifier to those individual voltage regulators is going to be wrong, and they're not going to be able to do what they're supposed to, but it is good enough for the logic and some of the other circuitry to start, and that's why we see that the firmware is up and running, because 5 volt is going to be pretty easy, and it probably even worked below that. But at the same time, the Whatever circuitry that is responsible for setting the contrast on the LCD, sometimes those are negative voltages depending on the LCD works, is probably not having the right voltage. And it's just set to a fixed value, and that is going to depend on this, and that explains pretty much what is going on. So we should be able to hopefully get this thing up and running. And there we go, a quick change. Now you also have to be careful because the fuse requirements are going to be different. So you can use the existing fuses if you really want to make sure everything is protected. I'm just temporarily doing that. Because when you're running at 230 volts, you're going to need much less current to run this instrument at the AC line coming in. But if you go to 115, you're going to need twice as much. So you have to be just a little bit careful about that. Well, in hindsight, I should have realized that because this does have the European phone number in the back of the unit and it is made in Germany, so it's clearly come from Europe. All right, moment of truth, here we go. And check it out, it looks good. Yeah, that was the only problem. Kind of embarrassing, but nonetheless, it seems to work now. Readings all over the place. It's actually changing now, it wasn't, so it kind of makes sense also because the minus and plus 15 volt supplies probably the analog circuitry wasn't working. So I can go to channel 2, nothing's connected of course, and if I press that, they are both showing up. Good! Well, let's see what we can do about the sensors. Well, now that we got the unit up and running, I couldn't resist but to buy some of these fancy C-series sensors for it. These two sensors cost 10 times as much as I paid for the unit itself. I have two of them. This one is the S121C. This is a half a watt sensor, and this is a 50 milliwatt sensor. Essentially, the difference between them is that that decade of dynamic range is moved down. So this has sensitivity on the lower side, better dark current and so on, and this can just absorb more power. On the other side, you can see the opening aperture. That's where the light needs to go in. And they have some certain standardized screws so you can attach it to other apparatus in free space optics. And this is the connector that plugs into the back of the unit. Now let's do some fun experiments and let's see how close these are to each other measuring some lasers. And here we go. Both of the sensors are connected to the instrument. They both get detected and the part number, serial number, and all the correction factors are automatically loaded into the unit. Both of the sensors are facing up towards the ceiling, so whatever ambient light there is in the lab is shining on them, and we're reading, you know, roughly about 50 microwatt from each of them, which kind of makes sense. I have here set the lambda to 670 nanometer for both, because that's the laser we're going to be measuring. Now, you have to be careful, because this is just a correction factor, because these sensors do not have a flat responsivity as a functional wavelength, so they're going to have to adjust that depending on what comes in. 
This also implies that in a situation where the light coming in is not monochromatic, like for example the light in the lab, we're not getting a 100% accurate reading anyway, because we cannot correct for all the frequencies at the same time, because we don't know what the wavelength is that's hitting the sensor. But this is a good sign that things are at least working. Okay, let's do some measurement here. So I have a semiconductor laser here. This is a red laser, 670 nanometer. The maximum power coming from this laser should be 5 milliwatt. Of course, lasers should always be taken very, very seriously. You have to have protection on your eye. It's just one mistake away from permanently damaging your vision. So we're going to turn this on. I'm going to place it directly on top of these sensors. So pretty much all the light coming out will be absorbed by that sensor. And then we can compare the readings between the two of them. This laser also has a quote-unquote modulation port, so we can turn it on and off with a logic, and there is some linear response of that. We wanted to see how linear that actually is, so we're going to measure that too. Let's give it a try. So I went ahead and I adjusted the laser output power using its modulation port to put out 1 milliwatt exactly, reading it on channel 1. And you can see indeed we're getting a nice stable 1 milliwatt measurement. Now I'm going to move the laser and put it at the input of the aperture of channel 2. And in that situation we should also see 1 milliwatt. And by the way this is between two ranges, that's why it's jumping. Let's go over here, put it under the second channel, and let's see what we get over there. And look at that, we're reading 1.058 milliwatt. So it's about 5.8% off from the other channel. Now some of this might be the differences between the sensors themselves, and some of it might be the calibration of this main instrument. And that's likely because it hasn't been calibrated in a very long time, and some offsets can develop in those situations. Now, this laser is not supposed to ever ex exceed 5 milliwatt. That's its maximum rating, and this is from a reliable source. So we should be able to check to see if that's true. We can create the maximum power it can produce. And look at that, 4.7 milliwatt. So it doesn't reach 5 milliwatt. It always stays below that. It is rated for class 3. So it all looks good. Now we can do some modulation and see if the laser output power can be linearly controlled or not. So the instrument has some plotting function. We can use and see how the power changes as a function of time. Right now we're in a one second per division, and when I apply that offset of two and a half milliwatt. So you can see a flat line because there is no modulation, and the power is constant. I'm going to turn on a triangular modulation at 0.1 hertz, and we should see a nice triangular shape if everything is linear. Let's try it out, turning it on, and look at that. That looks pretty good. So we have a nice triangular ramp, you can see it saturates a little soft at the top, comes back down, and then it stops. Yeah, so we do have this dynamic range of the laser power we can easily control. And that's a pretty useful feature for a laser diode because you may want to have a different amount of power, of course. Now, I don't know how fast you can modulate this laser because this instrument itself cannot sample super fast. But nonetheless, we can definitely measure some linearity aspects of that laser. It looks pretty good. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this quick video. The repair wasn't the most exciting thing in the world, but we did learn how this instrument works, did a couple of experiments, and certainly those sensors are pretty cool to have for future experiments in the lab. I have a lot of repair videos still in the queue, equipment that I have to look at, so make sure you subscribe so you don't miss those, and let me know what you think in the comment section. See you next time.